Hello and welcome to Coach the Commentator with Joe and John Crispin. Um, this is us messing around, trying to come up with things that make us cute. I'm going to turn this music down a little bit. That's that's intro music, man. That's You said that's pop in the Sirocco growing up. That might not be, actually. I think we need a little Kenny G. I think we need a little yeah. Kenny G, our grandfather and his Volkswagen Sirocco driving to a basketball game. We'd be playing some jazz music. Uh, I think that was a little smooth, put you to sleep jazz. So we might have to switch that up for the future, but something to get us started. All right. Well, we jumped the gun already. Um, this is the coach and the commentator. I am John Crispin. He is Joe Crispin. He's the coach. I'm the commentator, ESPN College Basketball Analyst. And uh, Joe is the head coach of Rowan University men's basketball. It's a Division three school here in South Jersey. Um, we call this the coach and the commentator, A, a because it's kind of cute. It's what we both do. But Joe, I, I think like for you, it was a little different, right? For you, it was almost like a combative version of the coach and the commentator. What's that? This this format? Well, the format, but like even the name, the coach and the commentator, because like there's been times in our lives where you've said like, I think actually verbatim, you've said, well, you can't do what I can do, what I do, but but I could do what you do. So there's this thought that coaches any coach can commentate but no commentators can coach and and while that is just a thought for the most part there's a lot of truth to it because commentators generally we just talk we have great ideas i'm, I'm like a politician i got all these ideas and if you just listen to me it'll, it'll all go well um but but coaches ultimately are the ones who say like yeah yeah that's great i actually have to do this stuff so so to a degree there's a little disconnect yeah, I think the the two elements when we talked about our original idea, and again, we've done this before on radio, and now we're going to move to a podcast format, is that people who know us assume we're going to spend a lot of time disagreeing and arguing uh, because that's how we grew up. Uh, usually that doesn't happen, but there usually is a good balance of perspective between the man in the arena and the man commentating on the man in the arena. True. Right? True. Um we have the, the the man in the arena was always a favorite of mine. That was in Pop's locker room, actually, at Camden County College. And, you know, I think there's that balance of saying good ideas are great, but you actually need to be able to explain them at a press conference when they don't work. That's different, right? So there's some who are taking risks. There's some that are putting their money where their mouth is. And uh, there's others who don't have to put their money where their mouth is. And I think there's a good dynamic there, and you're yep. pretty good at commentating, I think, because you recognize that. But there's many a commentator who forgets that, or worse, a coach who becomes a commentator and forgets who forgets that, that. or a yeah. player who becomes a commentator and forgets that. Those are actually the the guys who act as if they never had a bad night. Um, that's not really good. But there is a difference of perspective, and usually a broadening of perspective that you know when you. When you listen to coaches, um, you learn more. But I also learn a lot uh, by listening to good commentators. Mm. I don't know how much I believe that. <laughs> good commentators. Good commentators. Uh, yeah, but good commentators, it's getting to the point where we just kind of make a lot of noise and try to make news more so than tell people what's really going on. Hey, so you did mention we have done this before. We used to do this for, what, ESPN Radio and State College. Um, which was really cool for us. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know, we both went to Penn State. Joe finished there. I played four years at Penn State. I played two years at Penn State, two years, three years at UCLA. Um, but give, uh, give a little background. I think for people, look, I work for ESPN. I'm a, I'm a college basketball analyst. I've worked for Fox, the Big Ten Network, ESPN. I do the NCAA tournament for Westwood One. Uh, I am all over the country. And one of the best things about my job is that I get to not only see and watch and observe so many ways analyze uh, i get to spend time with the, the people that actually do this i get to see human dynamics play out in sport and it's the greatest thing in the world it really is i mean i learned so much I, I would say i learn more about people than i do about basketball half the time because it's the people dynamics that fascinate me the most but uh, give everybody a little bit you know kind of your elevator background um you had a long professional career and in so many ways, and it's something we're probably going to get to in this show at some point, uh, the concept of you being ready 
for your big job, right? That's been something that's always come up because look, you you played instead of getting right into coaching. And in so many ways, it, it's kind of hurt you. Like it's it's people have this idea that's like, well, you, you didn't work for a head coach. You weren't yeah. a tape guy. You weren't a this. So how are you ready? Well, it's like, well, there, there are a lot of things that you could say that maybe justify your readiness. Um, but but just give give everybody your your background over the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Well, I would say we need to have a whole episode on what that whole idea of ready means for any walk of life. I think that's a, a funny yeah. thing. Um, you know, were, were we ready to be Division One basketball players coming out of high school? Were we ready? It's That's funny. But um, Was I ready to cover Morris Peterson my freshman year? Um, no. no. Right. Where they went to the final four and that's why we lost to them twice. <laughs> um, well, I think, yeah, you know, naturally I played at Penn state. I played 11 years professionally, one year in the NBA, not as long as I wanted to, but I did is my standard answer to kids when they asked me. Um, I played in the minor leagues. I played in Greece, Poland, Italy, Spain, Turkey, Ukraine, multiple years in uh, a couple of those places. Um, 12 but, years overseas, 11 years, overseas. 12 11 years with probably a 12th where I was planning on it and just kept saying no to jobs. Cause that's how I retired. I didn't, I didn't retire. I just kind of kept saying no to jobs until they stopped coming. And I realized, um, I had an injury my 11th year was ready to go back for four or five more years and just slowly, but surely realized, um, I wanted to coach. I knew I wanted to coach. But that if I had waited, I, I would be sitting here at 40. You know, I'm 43 now that I wouldn't get started until I was closer to 40 rather than closer to 34, 35, which is where I ended up starting. So fortunately for me, we moved back here to South Jersey. Um, you know, and most people should know this as they, they listen in that we live behind each other. So these are a lot of backyard conversations. We're back. Yeah, we, we, we kind of do this anyway. That type We of do thing. this anyway, so we might as well record it. But um, I, you know, came here to Rowan had an opportunity opened up or they kind of opened one up for me to be an assistant for the men's and women's teams. Rowan's a large division three school right near our home. So I was tired of moving and uh, that was a great opportunity. I took it, um, then became a, a, a full time for both teams. And then coach Cassidy and I actually switched places in my third year. He was yep. a near retirement. Um, and he ended up ne- uh, retiring a couple years later. So I've been the head coach ever since. I think this is my sixth full season. I, I can't remember with COVID. I, I don't, people ask me about records and rankings and, and I'm like, you know, I got a game this week. That's what I got. I got a game on Wednesday. I want to win yep. it. I got a game on Saturday. I want to win it. And I haven't even looked at Saturday. <laughs> how, many games, how, it works. Wait, how many games a year do you play? 25 conference games. Um, we have, you know, our program is good. Uh, we're very talented. We're 15 and three. Um, you know, we're undefeated in our conference. Hopefully we can keep that up, but, uh, it was a rebuilding effort and now we're in year six or seven of that. And, um, we got a good thing going and it's a good thing going for our community. I run a lot of youth basketball stuff, uh, camps and clinics. I get five kids, you got two little boys and, and we're in, we're in the basketball yeah. world in a variety of settings. Um, we can be found, I can be found in the gym near you pretty often. And, and you've written a couple books on this. One, one of my favorite, we are going to sell some books on this. I promise you that. Like we're going to sell some books. Maybe especially after I write the ones you, (laughs) that's right. The, uh, the, your kid stinks and it's your fault. That's the book that has to get written. I know it's on my spring docket. And then the second one that has to get written is, and we're going to get into this, uh, throughout the, the weeks, the coming weeks here, um, fire your coach and hire the shot clock. That's a, that's a, Definitely. It's actually a series on YouTube. I sh- we should link to that. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, all right. Well, we'll get there. We'll get there. Make friends with those guys first. But uh, we, w- we will get into a lot of the different things um, we both like and don't like about the game. But the truth is, look, we both grew up in the game. Our pop played uh, grandfather, played at Temple uh, in the late 50s with Guy Rogers, Harry Litwack coach team, two Final Fours. Uh, the game was a lot different then. And I think uh, a lot of how we played probably drove Pop crazy, but I think he just, he loved it. He enjoyed it. Uh, Pop got to come to a lot of our games. Uh, Our our game at Kentucky, Pop was there, which was kind of cool given the fact that I think he lost both Final Fours to Kentucky. Um, So our whole whole world, I shouldn't say our whole world, but but so much of our life revolves around basketball. And the truth is, like, we, we both love it so much that I think we tend to get fired up about the things we don't like. And what we don't like is, 
not what you think, right? It's not like, oh, that was bad execution. It was like, no, that that's just a dumb game plan to begin with. You're trying to score in the 50s. Uh, and sometimes it's the rules. It's not officiating. It's the rules. We think the rules are dumb for basketball. We think the rules in college basketball often limit the game. So a lot of things we get into and we're going to get into on this show um, that <laughs> – it, it, we really do love what we get to do. And I think that's what I've been so blessed with is the fact that I get to do this. I know people joke. It's like you work five, six months out of the year and um, travel all around and see college basketball teams. But it's like, yeah, but it's a culmination of a lot of things, right? And it, and it hasn't always been easy and it has always been good. You know, two years at Penn State were great. My next few years at UCLA were not the same. And my career fizzled out after that. A lot of injuries and just limited opportunities and uh, limited performance on my part. But I was able to stay in the game this way. Um, and it's it's funny for me as a commentator, you you want to coach, but I think so many so much of what you want to do as a coach, coming from the the commentating realm, is proving yourself because you see it so much. And there's that thing inside your head, and you and I have it because we're just you know we're just confident and we believe in certain things. We have conviction. Um, Part of what I want to do as a coach is prove that there's a better way to do it. The reality is that's what you're doing, and, and it's not entirely easy. Uh, we're going to get into a number of things, again, throughout the coming weeks. We're, we're probably going to release one or two of these every week, if not more. Uh, there might be little topics here and there that, that jump out that we say, oh, we've got to put a video out and just respond to this. Because ultimately, what we want to do, and, and I want to give you a chance to kind of say what you're all about with this. We want to help you think like no one thinks anymore. We just react, you know, Twitter, social media in general, even the videos that, that our network puts out. Most of the time, it's just Stephen A. Smith reacting on something, not something he knows anything about. He's just reacting because that's what people get into. it. And, and for us, like we think there's a better way to serve the game. Uh, the better way to serve the game is to actually help people think about these things. There's there's more beneath the surface that I think we should get to. So for you, what would you say? you know, purpose number one is for this? Well, I think um, one is, yeah, the thinking through things and, and having different perspectives. I think one of the things when you go through like a history and a, and a little bit of a, a summary biographical information, um, I think people who know us uh, know us for being different from the beginning. Yeah. Um, and some of that was due to our high school experience with Coach Harper and our friends at Pittman, where we played very fast and we attacked and we shot threes quickly and we averaged eighty five points a game. And uh, you know, my team, my team averaged eighty nine point eight. So I don't know what you're I talking. Think your about. schedule was weaker. Uh, okay. um, but I don't even know if that number. I that's always what I just settled on. But I round um, up. I think it was ninety both years. I tell people ninety. What are they going to do? But the, the, the point being, like, we learned a lot and we were different. And I, what I, I, I often, when I talk to kids about, you know, in the staying in the basketball world, one of the things I said about myself biographically was surviving through differentiation. Um, mm -hmm. We always were, when I, we were questioners, we're, we were rebels on the court, you know, when I we're also why guys, right? Like, I think I was always a questioner, but I need, an, I need, an, I need yeah, I, why, right? I need an explanation for that because I don't agree. And, and there were some things that I was wrong. There were times I was wrong, right. On, on certain, remember a couple things in Europe with help situations that I'm like, I was completely wrong on that. And I should have trusted that, but there were plenty of things that were, our instincts were right. We learned a lot in high school about being aggressive, shooting quick threes, three for two, I mean, our coach understood yeah. analytics before there was even a word and or at least a word used in the basketball world. So we were we were big rebels in the sense that, um, no, I think you're wrong. I think we can play this way and we're still kind of wired to be that way. Um, yeah. I think a lot of that is due to the way we played. And, and, you know, I was probably better at it than you were in the sense that I was unwilling I, I did. It happened to me a couple of times where I kind of lost my edge and my identity um, as a player, but I was unwilling to compromise on that. After yeah. one or two times professionally, I said, this is who I am. This is how I play. If you don't like it, I'll go find another job. Well, you went and, through that in the NBA, right? I mean, like the Phoenix Suns well, were shooting, what, 15 threes a game? I think it was 13. It was even worse. Wow. And I was shooting 47% for him. Um, Those are attempts, by the way. But then you you go back to um, 
you go back to the coach and the commentator is as a coach at Rowan, um, I w- I want my team to be different. I want to try some different things. I am, I am, you know, you're similar to me. You're pretty good at the chit chat. Uh, I think I can chat with anybody, but I have to see whether these things actually work. Yeah. So when we talk about, um, you know, philosophies or whatever we'll talk about on any given episode, a lot of it does come back to, I, I need to be a practitioner. So I had philosophies about youth basketball and I'm like, all right, well, let's try it. Right. My own kids are guinea pigs. Sometimes I got philosophies on uh, college basketball and I had my you early teams. Really they would say, on- who's trying this? Right. My, my teams would say, who's trying this? And I'd say, I don't know. We hey, are. By the way, bear with me. I'm playing with things. Getting, yeah. Getting stuff ready. We, we don't know what we're really doing yet. So the uh, so we well, can probably edit it out once you figure that out. But the the thing uh, that I think I go back to is like I you are dealing in the realm of ideas. So am I. But I actually have to uh, justify putting them in practice. <laughs> you have to answer to them. Yep. And, and you actually have to implement them. And you have and to, sometimes you I've have lost. Do, but you have to do the things that we always challenged, which was like, well, why? This doesn't feel right. Because you're also dealing with, like you talked a lot about basketball rehab, right? Where you wanted to almost in a way create basketball rehab for your team. Where it's like. Yeah, especially for transfers. I think yes. that's something that's, a, that's, that's, that'd be an interesting topic actually Ooh, for Division One, Especially today with the portal. Coaches, yeah, the portal. Mm-hmm. A lot of coaches don't understand that. Right, like kids, if they're burned out or all these different dynamics that are at play, um, and again, I didn't, I didn't know that when I got into it, but I had, I had experienced burnout myself. I had experienced bad situations myself, and I had to recover so I could speak to that. But yeah, I think just in general, um, you know, you've said this before too, as a commentator, that there's often a disconnect. Uh, coaches will shut down commentators when they think commentators are just. Talky, talky, talk, man. You just, you're just Blow talking hearts. for yourself to make yourself look good, and you're not really trying to. You're telling me what a good shot is, and yeah. you don't know what I'm trying to do, right? Those kind of conversations that I think I know we'll get into. We already have, and we will again. Um, but I think that's plenty of way of introduction. I think we should launch into a little bit of uh, commentary. Uh, we can go a little more onto the commentary today. Uh, based on one of your uh, most recent semi-viral moments, I don't, I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah, I don't know about how viral. I don't think it was viral, but I think it was a good comment that uh, some people heard. I think it was a fair comment, and I think it also comes at a time where I am, I'm tired. Uh, I'm tired of the way we discuss things with this absolutism, right? It's and it's our world. It's it's all throughout our world. We are. Absolutely one way or absolutely the other. And I think another thing that we'll probably get into is, is that you and I are nuanced people. Like we see everything as gray. And I shouldn't say everything, but especially in the game, like you've got to see the nuance. You've got to see the gray. It's not absolutely a bad shot. It, what's the situation, right? Maybe it looks like a bad shot, but you and I are the type of people that say, well, what if it went in? What, what now? Like that's kind of the way we think. Or, oh, uh, they, they should have done this. Well, how do you know that if they did something different, the outcome's any different? So it's like yep. these, these could have been these, worse. These hindsight experts, um, we do that a lot. But it, when it comes to NIL, and this is what I was ranting about, I watched adults completely ruin an opportunity to push the game forward. And pushing the game forward is like, you know, how much further does it need to go? Well, the reality is the game needed to respond to the realities of today. The realities of today are social media. The realities of today are kids do have a certain value. What is that value? It's super arbitrary, right? At best. We have no idea what the value really is. Then you see what's happening. And you see that some schools are putting $20, $30 million from a collective together to entice kids to come to school. And it's sickening. And to me, it is an example of, frankly, stupid people and weak leaders. Like we can't see ahead. We're so scared that someone else is going to get a player maybe that I think could help me too, that we're going to do whatever someone else is willing to do, regardless of whether it's right or wrong. And then we're going to watch everything kind of crumble to the point we're at right now already, where you have multiple players who are sitting out, willing to sit out, holding out because of these NIL deals that maybe aren't coming through. Where there are some out there that are doing it the right way, 
People that have been at a school for multiple years are profiting the most. Centers in particular, Hunter Dickinson, Zach Eady, uh, Oscar Shibwe at, at Kentucky. Now, that might be a different story. I don't know enough about that to say whether he's really capitalizing on his name, image, and likeness or whether he's just capitalizing on being a big at Kentucky. So I'm going to stay away from that. But th- this was my rant, and we can just we can just kind of comment off of this because to me there's a lot more to be said, and there was more that was said, but y- you can't give everybody the full take in a college basketball game, even if it's a blowout. So, so take a listen. And I may have to mess with this because, again, we're new at this. Really capitalize on name, image, and likeness. Go be great somewhere and stay there. If you go be great somewhere and stay there, they sell hockey jerseys <laughs> with Zach Eady's number and name on it as part of an NIL. Why? Because he's awesome and they'll buy it. That's what NIL is supposed to be for. It's not to entice kids to come make $13 million to be the quarterback before you've done a darn thing in college sports. Let's figure this stuff out if we want this to be sustainable. Sorry. Gosh, I'm not sorry. No, screw it. <laughs> Golly. I'm not sorry as long as you and I get a Zach Eady hockey jersey out of it. <laughs> God bless him. Kevin you, Brown. Man. Kevin Brown, God bless him. He does a good job keeping me in line, uh, but he knows I'm I'm – Rolling, so he lets me go. Well, he also knows he's in a game where one team scored 25 points in 30 minutes Very of basketball. True. Very um, true. So it's almost like a baseball game blowout. Like things are going to come up and you got to roll with it. Did um, they have 12 and, at the half, I think it was. And they, no, like, they barely got into double digits. It was nine, and I was watching and I was yeah. like, this is brutal, uh, especially with the way I love scoring. But um, yeah, you need to wait on that hockey jersey. But I think. It's a good commentary. I think it's a, a larger conversation that a lot of people don't want to have. But I think one of the things to step to take a step back into this in way of introduction is like our, the, the vision for college sports. Yes. Um, you know, one of the, the big positives for college sports is just how community oriented universities are yeah. uh, in our culture, um, in our states, in our cities, in our towns. Um, there's supposed to be a connection between the community and, uh, and the university. And that often happens. I mean, the front porch for that happening oftentimes in our culture are sports, the big, the big sports, right? Yeah. Especially college football, men's college basketball. There's a few others uh, sometimes at schools that are, that are popular um, and spectator sports that, that can, can actually make a few dollars and not lose money. Um, but regardless, right, even if they're not, huge spectator sports they're community events right they they bring yeah. students to it that it is for our school it's a division three school but it's still a community event we want students to participate and parents to bring their kids and to have a fun time on a wednesday night or a saturday afternoon so when you view it in that way which is how we view it and we view it that way because we experienced it at penn state and i think you also view it that way cuz you experienced less of it at ucla yeah, than you did it yeah yeah than you did at penn state um when when college sports goes to the free agent only big box you know everyone wants to act like a big market team mindset um a lot of people lose including um the the kids themselves and the communities themselves so you know it doesn't fit with the vision it doesn't yeah. fit with the ideal in college basketball or college football or any other sport, men's or now, women's. Are you saying it doesn't fit like it doesn't fit the way it's presently being applied? Because to me, the, the present application, the, the failure is on the people who completely took advantage of this and started putting $20 million into a collective to entice kids to come play there. That to me is the issue. So I never had an issue with name, image and likeness for what it really is. If you really, if you're Zion Williamson and people say, gosh, I want you to promote anything I'm doing and I'll pay you to do it, that makes sense. It's it, clearly that's an individual with value. But if the school's doing it, then ultimately your value is by be is for being at that school. Like otherwise that money's not there. So I, I think I think we've completely hijacked what could be a good system, which is also probably due to the fact that the NCA was neutered by conference uh, Congress. Like the NCA has no ability to, you know, I don't know, um, litigate, legislate, whatever. You know, they, they can't hold yeah. them accountable. Well, uh, so, and, and so that- you knew coaches were going to take advantage of this, but to me, it's, it, it's kind of pathetic when I think about it to think of, of adults who are supposed to be the leaders in this situation, scrambling 
to put money together. To, to I mean, the, the thirteen million dollar quarterback. Look, uh, that's a specific kid. I don't want to mention kids by name. That's not right. But you know what I'm talking about. Well, that this didn't is a even high pan out either. Yeah, oh, because because it dropped down to nine million, like nine million over three years. It's a three year nine million dollar deal. I mean, there are there are NFL quarterbacks who aren't getting three years nine million dollars. So that's I mean, what this is, that's what it actually dropped down to. Dropped down to nine million. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that's absurd. And um, also stinks I, for me because my agent, I think, represents and probably makes more money off of uh, high school kids and middle school kids than he does off of me. So it's not really good for my job. Kids security with big either. Instagram followers. And and I yeah. think there's, well, I think that the other step back that a lot of people need to recognize is just how overly attached we are to money uh, because the more money that's involved, the more we lose our minds in any given market. Um, everyone wants to get in on it and then everyone wants as much as they can. So, well, the, and then there's the, also, but there's also the evil empire narrative, which is NCA is the evil empire, right? That's, you know, it's it, Darth Vader runs the NCA for all we know. I mean, that's kind of the, the general narrative and these poor kids, that, that's kind of like the, again, the, the word, the verbiage, the rhetoric, the narrative, it's, it's political like anything else. We're very selective. And, and well, it's, but it's, 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 it's political, but it's also, driven by the desire for more money so that yeah. even this market we're essentially in this boom of a market because it's new right it's like cryptocurrency in a sense like when it's brand yeah, new and then it hits though. this certain point um is that we don't really even know the value I mean, there's no even way of verifying what people are making so many of these people yeah. who are uh involved in this are just trying to inflate what they're actually being offered so that they can get more. There, there's no way of verifying. There's no system to say, yeah, this is an offer sheet. Because like, nobody's it's not, showing. Because it's not technically legal. <laughs> That's the thing. That's well, no, it, it is legal as long as it's being done outside the athletic department, which I have my doubts. Yeah, um, I just saw I just saw an athletic department, might be Alabama, a new NIL center. And I'm just like, okay, so what is this really for? Or is it really just we have so much money we're gonna show that we're we're supporting our student athletes this way? It's for all student athletes, because you know, all student athletes are just gonna roll in the NIL money. Well, it, and this is what I'd say, like the NIL itself, we don't feel bad about, but there no. are I think what has to happen over time and is that it needs to be more of a reward tool than a recruiting tool. Hundred percent because if if it's a reward tool, it becomes a positive recruiting tool. Like, come here and be a part of our community. We do take care of our kids, but there's there needs to be an actual justification for it beyond we want you to come here. All right. So and let, I think let, that's take, a, let's apply let's apply you know present company here because I've always made this argument and the same argument I was making about Zach Eady was like go somewhere, be great there, serve that serve them well, serve that community well, and they will take care of you. You and I experienced that at Penn State. And I, and I think a lot of people are like, yeah, but yeah, these guys are on another level. And I said, you don't get it. It doesn't matter what level these kids are. In that community, we were, we mattered, you know, and we were inspiring the way we played because we looked like everybody else. So we, you know, we were identifiable to them. Um, yeah, I think but, in most respects, most of our team was. Yeah, we yeah. fit into the community. Yeah, but just and that, that's what ideally I think good college teams do. They fit into their, their, um, college Purdue, community, Iowa, right? Wisconsin. You think about these Big Ten teams that you, yep, yeah. But e even UCLA, I mean, even they're even they e different communities are different, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. UCLA, North Carolina, like they they historically have a lot of North Carolina great recruits, right? Mister Kentucky basketball is going to go to Louisville or Kentucky, right? Yeah. Like that. That's right Louisville, right? Now. Indiana, yeah, probably not, but historically that's the way it works right and those are positive things for the college community and supposed to be positive things for the kids and if there are millions and billions of dollars involved it is okay absolutely for that to happen but you just want it to happen more um in the sense that it's a reward for entering in and serving a community well more than just an enticement because yeah. eventually there's going to be all sorts of clauses it's like you only get this money if you're an actual starter and you deliver, right? Yeah. There's no, it's, what is this, a guaranteed deal? Well, and then we what start looking guy, at unions. Now we're, we're going to have players' unions. Well, what if the, co the quarterback doesn't pan out? What if he doesn't start? Yeah. You're going to pay him the same amount of money? No, you're not. You shouldn't. Not if you're, unless you're a really dumb businessman. Well, that was Spencer Rattler, wasn't it? Yeah, and you got money to throw around. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't think the NIL was happening before he came, but there was other stuff happening at different places, I'm sure. Yeah. So I think. 
you know, in this competitive environment, we also talk about big market teams, small market teams. Um, even within the Power Five, there are big market teams and small market teams. Yeah, and you 100%. might have a big market team in uh, football, for example, but have a small market team in basketball. Yeah, that happens too. Um, Penn State. You know, Alabama could have been one until now. Yeah, right now they're yeah. starting to break into that bigger market um, using some of that football money. Penn State similar, um, although. You know, Penn State football still is not on that top tier in terms of the Ohio States and the top five, you know, money spending institutions um, or locations for that matter. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think it's a I think it's a valid point. And then to your second point in terms of weak leadership, I think what I've seen um, in basketball, right, and I saw this uh, as a player uh, times a thousand, right, because I played overseas. And I see, I, I'm very, very resistant to it as a coach. Is just how many things are driven by fear. Yeah. Um, yep. They're not driven by a conviction that this is good, that this is right, or even that this will work. It's driven by a conviction, um, by fear of losing your position, or by fear of uh, people not thinking you're doing a good enough job recruiting. Um, and even that fear is often based upon a lack of identity, a lack of understanding yeah. of who you are, right? And, you know, here I am at a big D3 school, but the, we at least understand who we are, right? And like, part of that is, is knowing who you're not, too. I think there's a, there's a big piece there where everybody's trying to be, if you're at a Power 5 conference, you're trying to be like everybody else at the top of your Power 5 conference, when the reality is like, Knowing who and what you're not isn't a bad thing either. Well, yeah, and the most extreme thing I always say, and you've heard me say this a million times, is is like if if someone came along and offered me a million dollars, uh, here I am at a, a D3 coach and I'm running youth clinics and all this other yeah. stuff. And um, you know, I got kids missing class, you know, missing half a practice for class and whatever, and paint peeling from the ceilings in my cinder block office. Cinder block but, office. <laughs> yeah, but I, I I would never take that money for anyone who wasn't clear about who they were as a school, as an institution, as yeah. a community, as a, as a person, right? Like your expectations, you know, if I'm sitting down with anyone and they're not seeing themselves clearly or seeing their school clearly, I am out. There's no way. And yeah. that is everywhere. Right. And these people are responding. And what's happened in this environment is they're responding. And I saw this. And the reason I say that is I saw this in professional basketball times a thousand. Right. Overseas in particular is just driven by fear. It's driven by the, it's, it's, it's driven by a desire not to lose more than it is to win. Yeah. Right. And as I always tell my team, I, I create game plans to win by 25 against everyone. Yeah. I want to try to win by 25, 30 against everyone. Means that doesn't you may, mean you might lose by 25, 30 on some nights. It, it means if we're not careful, we better watch out. Yeah. Right. And now part of that is you, you, before you can win, you, you need to not lose. Right. So, like, I, I'm not as risk taking now that I have a more talented team than maybe I've had before. Um, whereas before I did take some, some bigger risks. But um, the point being, you got to know who you are. Right. And I, I think there's a lot of communities right now who have lost their souls. And the where you see that is in their sports and the decisions they yeah. make in their sports. Um, the, the NIL money is an indication of that. The way they hire is an indication of that. The fact that a lot of these institutions can't hire anyone without a, a, a firm doing a lot of the work for them. Yeah. Um, now, listen, some of that is just the firm sifts through a lot of things. That's fair, but some of it isn't. Some of it is literally uh, they need someone to go through all the checks that, that they need to explain at a press conference. And that shows that these institutions aren't clear about who they are. Yeah. A lot of them. Some of them are. Some of them are. And the bigwigs can be the bigwigs, um, but a lot of them might be missing. So, um, you know, I think, yeah, that's the NIL conversation. Um, I don't think NIL is a negative thing. I no. don't think we're saying that. Nope. I just think a lot of communities and leaders need to look themselves in the eye and wonder, do I really, am I really clear about what I'm all about and what I should be about? Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, it's it, it's probably not a conversation that's done for us. Like you know, we're, we're going to probably talk about topics. It's going to come back. Something's going to come back out. I mean, there's there's news every day that makes me cringe. Uh, but the more you hear about this stuff, it, it just comes top of mind. And then when you see it applied properly, you're like, wait a second, why are some of the best figuring this out yet? other people are still putting $10 million together just to get three recruits to come there. And like all this stuff that happened this, this past summer with, with uh, Jimbo Fisher and Texas A&M and Nick Saban. I mean, does, does anybody listen or believe any of this stuff anymore? Like, Oh, we're not doing that. It's like, you know, you totally are everybody. Like we, what? Like, are, are we serious anymore? It's, it's uh, what's bothers me a lot of times is that you do see sports in so many ways reflect, the current social situation, which also means we argue like it's politi- like it's political. Like when I make this statement about, I think NIL is out of control. People say, "Oh, well, you don't think think these kids should be getting anything?" It's like, no, I didn't well, say who that. Said that? Yeah, I'm just yeah. saying when, that's the that's the typical that's- argument. It's this black or white, um, absolutely this or absolutely that, and that's where again, it's like I believe in the nuance, but I believe intelligent people who do have conviction who are fearless, not full of fear of like, well, if we don't do it, we're going to lose out. Or what do people think if we're not putting this together? How can I keep a job if I'm not doing what other schools are doing? Like enough of that. Like stand on something, say what you're all about. And and frankly, if I'm someplace and they say, well, we need to be doing this too, I I might have to say I'm out. And I have no problem doing that. I know it's easy for me to say in in the situation I'm in, but part of me wants to see that happen. I want to see someone say, I mean, look, Jay Wright, uh, Mike Bray's retiring. You're starting to see more and more guys. Coach K's retired. You see more and more guys saying, "Like this is a world I, I don't know if I want to be in." Let alone, well, a lot, a lot of those guys are, are reckon, uh, understandably saying, uh, "I didn't sign up for this," uh, yeah. which is true, right? For yeah. a lot of them, that's what's true. And even like the transfer situation, you know, like, uh, like I have no problem with it because I signed up for this. So I, I'm just like, well, this is you know, I lived in free agency my whole professional career. And that's essentially what this is. And, and there's a way to navigate it that I think helps individuals and you can help your program and still stay true to your identity. Um, but in terms of the money and, and the NIL situation, I think it really, it really does go back to communities and, and, and leadership not knowing who they are. Because yeah. if you know who you are um, and you know what your identity is and you know what you stand for, then you should know what kind of team you should have, yeah. right? So even... Um, you know, to, to go to the extreme, right, is if, well, for example, I, I'll just use my own examples because that's what I know. Um, you know, you kind of have to be a spin master, right? And, yeah. and yeah. take, well, we, we always talk about, and this is something for, for coaches, is letting the limitations guide you. Um, yeah. Instead of resisting limitations, actually embracing the limitations as your guide and better yet, clarifying even more limitations so they can guide you better, creating yeah. your own. Yeah. So, you know, the limitations of facilities, for example, um, you can look at it one way of, oh, geez, we don't have what somebody else has. Or you can say, I'm going to go find dudes that like this. Yeah. That's my mentality. You like, guys I'm that gonna, run to it. Yep. I'm going to get guys who, who want to have this chip on their shoulder. I'm going to get guys. So like when I took over, we had a locker room that I, I don't know. I don't think it ever been done. Like it was literally you, you actually built the lockers. Yeah. That was the second year I built the lockers with our assistant coach and my, my players painted the locker room and like it was, I don't even think we were supposed to do it and we did it anyway. Um, and, but the the point being is like, I, I, guys who, who wanted to be a part of a rebuild were attracted to that. They liked that. That was part of our identity. So we used that. We didn't go against the grain complaining that we needed. We would have been a waste of time. We weren't getting a new locker room. Nobody else was building them. You know, if somebody else did it, would it cost like a million dollars? Cost yeah, me like public school, like a thousand bucks. Pre- your you know prevailing I mean? wage, yeah. It I just went down done. to Peter Lumber and built the built the <laughs> lockers. You know, so it's it's one of those things though that if if you if you don't go against the grain, you go with the grain. Yeah, this is the grain. It is what it is, right? And and you know, even in terms of um, you know nil, that that can be true if if you're going with the grain and in you're you're in one of those communities where you can really capitalize on that. Like, I don't know, even if you're in Ivy League and you got these huge venture capitalist firms and whatever, and they want to roll with that, we'll find a way to take advantage of that. There's nothing wrong with that, yeah. right? But you know, 
if you're not, don't resist that. Don't try to pull a fast one. Don't try to be doing all this dishonest stuff, getting involved with, you know, shady people who are trying to just uh, balloon this market that barely exists. Yeah. Um, that, that, you know, are ballooning offers that aren't even there. I don't want to be a part of that. So I think there's a way to navigate it, but I think a lot of division one schools, I think, uh, especially at the mid-major level, but even at the high major, even in the power five, they need to take a look in the mirror and ask themselves whether they really recognize who they are. Um, because I think the ones that do uh, can venture out into the future. Yeah. Uh, the ones who don't are going to suffer. And to go back to your original comment, who were you talking about? You're talking about Purdue. Matt Painter yeah. knows who Purdue is. He's a Purdue guy. He recruits Purdue guys. He stayed true to their identity Four years, for the most part, I think. Has he even had a transfer? Maybe one or two. I've, That's it's crazy question. that I'm Matt asking Harms, that question. Yeah, Matt Harms did a couple years ago. and I No, think no, maybe, but he transferred out. But I'm oh, saying yeah, yeah, yeah. transferred in. God, that's a great question. That's um, crazy when you think about it. Well, yeah, there was a there was a guy a couple years ago. I forget his name. He looked like he was about forty five years old. It doesn't, from but Dart the fact League. that we're actually asking that question yeah. is amazing yep. in today's environment. And I'm all about my program is all about transfers. I've created a transfers dream, but um, that's the way I think we have to do it here. But that shows that he knows who that community is, that his leadership knows who that community is, and that they're even their NIL situation, however it works, whatever it is, and they're selling that hockey jersey because Edie was grew up playing hockey. Like yeah. it's, it's incredible. It's awesome. That's fun. That's their identity. I, I think it's cool. I think it, it enhances the student athlete experience and the community, you know, the whole thing. So it's a positive thing. Oh, there's a reason why Mackey Arena is the best in the country. And I say the best. It's it's up Did there. Did we ever with win at Mackey? Five. Did we ever win? Did I never I did. Win? I never did. I didn't play there my sophomore year. Well, we only played there my freshman year. That was Carson Cunningham, Brian Cardinal. They were they were good. They were fun. We Gene beat them at home, but I, I don't know that yep. we ever won there. Incredible place to play. Oh, uh, and, and as today, it always is in the Big it's, Ten. It's been incredible. Um, all right, so we should probably. I'm just looking at the time here. Uh, no one's probably listening anymore, but this is this is this is our time frame because I think the one thing I'd say we talked about like 30 minutes, 45 minutes. You know, if we want to get into something a little more nuanced, which is what our goal yeah. is, we're going to have to do this once or twice a week for 45 minutes because you can't get underneath the surface. Like we do value getting underneath the surface on any given topic and it leads into other topics. It does take some time. And usually you or I have at least a couple, two or three minute by ourselves rants in there. But the, the other thing is, I, I think it's also important to point out, like just because we're saying this doesn't mean we think we're absolutely right. I'm just giving you a perspective. It's our perspective. We have conviction behind our perspective, mainly because we're not opinionated people. We think about what we think about. Like I always tell kids, I don't know, like, I'm pretty opinionated. <laughs> you are more opinionated than I am. I'm, I'm more, again, I'm, I'm more nuanced in everything. Let me explore a little bit. And I would say like the difference between you and I is, is not our foundation and it's probably not where we are going. It's, it's how we get there. So sometimes the, the nuance for us is in our own perspectives, but I think for the most part, we're in alignment here. The, the differing perspective is, is ultimately you're doing this. Uh, and it's something that likely as you continue in your career, you're going to have to face at the next level. It's it's going to be, hopefully it's a reality that's somewhat controlled. Um, but as we get out here, and I'm going to watch this, watch this. I'm going to play a little. I guess it's Kenny J. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But I'm playing it either way. Let's turn it up. Is it here we go. Our little outro music. Uh, what do you want to get into next? Got anything top of mind? Because every time we did this for for ESPN Radio State College, we would change our mind by the end of the the show, and we talk. We, about we need to get into some basketball stuff. Um, you know, we we're gonna get it next episode. We're gonna get into some basketball philosophical stuff, guarding the three point line, some what some about, key what things about that rules? are. Should we get into the rules conversation? Because everybody complains about officiating. And I think uh, uh, the way we look at it is like, yeah, okay, you can say what you want about officiating, but I think the rules stink, and that's why the game at times stinks. I'm in. Let's let's look at the limitations. Let's get into that. Let's get into that. I mean, because I think that's something that uh, mainly our guy Zach, producer Zach, could put tags on, and people will actually look at it because they just want to complain about officials. So let's do that. Let's let's talk. Let's talk rules and officiating in college basketball next, whenever that is. This at some week. Point, some point here we'll know how to get you guys to subscribe and do all those other things that we're supposed to tell you to do uh but 
we at least got one on the board, right? We the We're crowd in. was up until we scored. We scored now. The crowd can sit. We can settle in. Uh, the game can start. So we, we hope uh, we hope people enjoy this. Um, we enjoy the conversations. And, and if there's ever anything um, people want us to talk about, leave a comment. Uh, I'm sure we'll find it at some point. Both of us are terrible at social media. We're terrible at this stuff. Uh, we're not really good self-promoters. I'm a talker, but just have a tough time with Twitter and social media. So leave comments. Let us know if there's something you want us to get into. Because the more we get into things, the more you'll see how we think. It's a little different. It uh, doesn't mean we're right, but we just think a little differently. And I lost my music already. So we'll we'll cap it off now. Oh, I got it on loop. We're good. Uh, we'll cap it off now. Joe and John Crispin, it's the coach of the commentator. We'll talk to you next time.